The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Morningstar IM, ABN 54071-808501, AFSL 228-986, and Ox Capital Management, ABN 60648-887914, AFSL 533-828, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. How are you now? And welcome to the Ensemble Investment Podcast. My name is James Whelan, Managing Director of Barclay PS Capital's Wealth Management Team, and I'm here to represent you, the humble advisor, doing their best to walk the line between client interests and asset class selection. We're trying to find the things that are not only appropriate, but that are actually working to be in the right things at the right time, the right weight for the right clients. So get set because myself and Morningstar are going to do our absolute best to answer some of the questions that have come up on the Ensemble platform. All information contained is general in nature. So here we go. Morningstar Investment Management Australia is delighted to be sponsoring Ensemble's investment podcast series designed to equip advisors to have more meaningful conversations with clients. Morningstar Investment Management is a global leader in asset allocation, investment research and portfolio construction. Specialising in investing, behavioural coaching and practice optimization. Morningstar strives to give advisors the tools to confidently navigate their clients' complex needs. Morningstar, empowering investor success. Ox Capital Management, OxCap, is an Australian-based boutique investment manager specialising in emerging market equities. Founded in 2021, OxCap brings together a team of experienced emerging market investors led by Dr. Joseph Lai. We aim to deliver consistent outperformance by investing in high-quality, undervalued, well-run companies that are leveraged to the fast growth opportunities and long-term trends arising out of emerging markets. How are you now and welcome to the Ensemble Investment Podcast brought to you by Morningstar. My name is James Whelan, Managing Director of Barclay PS Capital's Wealth Management Team and I'm here to represent you, the humble advisor, doing their absolute best to walk the line between client interests and asset class selection. We are trying to find the things that are not only appropriate but also work and maybe trying to find the right thing at the right time with the right weight for the right clients. Tough enough for any of us but get set because myself and Morningstar are going to do our best to answer some of the questions that have come up on the Ensemble platform, and obviously all information contained is general in nature, so here we go. Well, anyone who knows me and knows my history knows that I don't mind an emerging market. Uh, I've tried them all. He goes sort of rambling off here. Sampled the fineries of opaque gold miners in South Africa, Chinese virtual listed health providers, South Asian mayonnaise manufacturers, and South Korea's one stock, apparently. I've even tasted the edge of the frontier in Russia before it became a little uncool. And Q8, uh, where some real fun starts to start on that on that uh, on that frontier. However, for now, this podcast isn't about me. So we've brought in two of the finest minds that we can find in markets to help us navigate the frontier for us. Uh, I am joined by Joseph Lai, principal and portfolio manager of Ox Capital, and Bryce Anderson of Morningstar, who's a portfolio manager there as well. G'day, guys. How are you going? Good day, James. Thank you. How was that intro? Is that okay? Yeah, it's great. Thanks. Good. Uh, good feedback. So, uh, look, everyone gets the same question. Um, we'll go with the non Morning Star guest here. So, Ox Capital, Joseph, everyone gets the same question. Or Joe, okay. sorry. Joe, Joe's good. Joe's yeah. good. Um, yeah, what do you do and how do you make money? Okay. So, what we do is to is we um, look across the emerging markets um, equities and look for um, really strong companies with quality and sustainable growth and cheap valuation. Um, and then, you know, we put it together in the portfolio. Uh, we believe that you know such companies, um, you know, especially at the moment, is extremely um, attractively valued, uh, given you know that there's actually you know a lot of um, uncertainties in the world. Uh, quality, growth, and valuation, we believe, is is this uh, recipe for success. Okay, very good. Well, I, and that's going to mix in quite well with the Morningstar side, which is all about valuation. Bryce, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Um, for having me. No, no worries at all. How was my intro? You haven't. Was it okay? It's, it's same reasonable. I've got a low bars. So. All right, <laughs> <laughs> very good. Low bars, low bars. How are you? Now, I, unlike the investing world, where high bars are absolutely the high, uh, the, 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 the the way to go about it. Um, what do you do at Morningstar? Yeah, so. I'm a portfolio manager in our investment management business within Morningstar. And at our heart in the investment management business, we're a multi-asset business. So I guess in a bit in a contrast to what Joseph's doing with equities, we're looking across the whole gamut of assets from 
equities to bonds, emerging markets, developed markets, domestic, and trying to find through our valuation-driven asset allocation approach the best place for us to have money and grow grow investors' wealth. Got it. Well, that's that's fairly easy to, to comprehend, so no problem there. Joe, now you did mention that you saw some valuation bits and pieces out there, so we're just going to get right into the thick of it uh, as we now. Let's start general. What are you seeing out there at the moment? And then we're going to get to some of the questions because I've got a string of questions that are here and myself, having done a lot of stuff in the macro space, my emerging markets, I want to pick your brain with bits and pieces that we can find as well. So let's start big picture. What are you seeing out there in the emerging market space uh, okay. at the moment? Sure. Um so, I mean, you know, what we're seeing is that, you know, the bulk of investors' interest is actually in developed markets, right? Mm. So, as so we can see, the valuations of developed markets, particularly certain sectors within the developed markets, is actually, you know, quite expensive. Um, across the majority of emerging market equities, um, you know, valuation is very cheap as a result, you know, of the money not being not being invested there. Like it's just not a popular place to invest in for quite a long time. So as a result, I mean, the valuations, generally speaking, extremely attractive. I mean, there's lots of, um, you know, great companies that's trading on, you know, multi-year or even multi-decade lows in terms of, you know, price to earnings multiple. Um, so, you know, it's actually quite a nice fertile ground to, to hunt for ideas uh, for, for a bottom-up manager like ourselves. Okay, no worries. And the, from the Morningstar side of you, valuation, are you seeing the same sort of thing in valuations? Yep, I'll probably echo what, what Joe said around like when we look at our universe and uh, developed markets versus emerging markets. I think emerging markets stacks up pretty well from a valuation perspective and some of that, I guess, some of its hype, some of it's around some of the like IT, for example, and AI is very concentrated in the, in the US specifically. But it also has created opportunities elsewhere. Capital's flown to the, those parts of the market and left other parts of the market. And mm-hmm. emerging markets is probably part of that. And but then emerging markets is a pretty broad, broad um, pool. So yeah, yes, it's, it's one bucket, but there's plenty of stuff and plenty of divergence within emerging markets. So I think the term emerging markets is, I guess, used in a quite a a generic sort of one asset type thing, but it's a pretty, it's a broad universe, just like developed markets is a broad I, I, universe. I've, I've got to say to Joe, I mean, if, if if you just said, I've got my allocation at emerging markets and it was just buying everything that would be under there, you'd probably wind up flat every single time. How do you how do you pick them apart, Joe? Sure. Um, so, um, yeah, the interesting thing is when we actually look from a bottom-up perspective, um, the opportunities um, available um, are actually, it's actually not that different to that of developed markets. For example, you know, we can find, you know, if, you know, the very hot, you know, AI related, um, plays in emerging markets on, on single digit multiples, um, as opposed to, you know, 30, 40 times PE. Um, so really, um, for, from our perspective, uh, you know, in terms of hunting for the interesting opportunities in emerging markets is not that different, you know, to hunting for developed markets opportunities. It's those, you know, st- stocks or companies with, you know, strong quality uh, franchises, uh, good, sustainable, long-term growth. Um, and I guess the difference, at least at the moment, is that the valuation is a lot cheaper. So that's um, sort of how, how we go about it. Yeah, no worries. Okay, well, I- I'm actually going to start. I-, I get handed a list just so that people can sort of visualize what it is that I go through. The, the questions go into the, the ensemble platform and then that sort of gets generated into, into a list of things. I've got that sitting in front of me right now. Just for anyone who's listening, uh, that's there. I'm going to go to the bottom and then I'm going to work my way back up to the top for this one. So, so this is sort of changing it around. First off, and we're just going to ask, uh, ask these questions. Whoever wants, the, whoever wants the answer, go for it. I'll do it. I think you both get this one. What should advisors, and we're trying to help advisors here, what should advisors be looking for when investing in emerging markets? Well, I, I think like for a multi-asset investor um, – you uh, maybe I'll talk about this a different way. Like we're thinking about a whole portfolio. Yep. So when you're looking at a whole portfolio, multi-asset portfolio, looking for different assets that do different things at different times and because you want to smooth the ride and grow that wealth and see. So there's you want have there's different assets in your portfolio doing different things. I'd say in like, if we're talking emerging market equities, I'd say obviously that's probably there's a growth element to that. So the return side. But I think if you also think of an Australia investor specifically, emerging markets provide a lot of things that Australia doesn't have. Yeah. So it has access to, like we don't have a, a large proportion of our market in IT, for example, but if you go offshore into into emerging markets, into whether it's 
in China, Korea, thing Taiwan, you've got Samsung, you've got Taiwan Semiconductors, you have these sort of global businesses that provide things that we just don't have in Australia when you look at um, the banking sector and the miners. Yep. Just gives you more things and global leaders in particular industries that you just otherwise wouldn't get access to. Joe, is that, is, is that the same sort of thing that you look for, just the big sort of one big th- couple of big things? I mean, TSMC and Samsung, that's the, the, they're your two stocks in those two countries, right? That's There's got to be more than that though, isn't it? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I agree absolutely with um, Bryce's characterization. I mean, you know, EM is a bit uh, provides diversification, benefits from invest uh, from an investor's perspective, um, but it's just the access, right? I mean, the access of, um, you know, truly global champions, which are not available domestically. Again, I agree with Bryce on that. Um, you know, and, and, you know, when I, you know, I visit, um, you know, Asia and other EM countries quite often. And the reality is, I mean, when we go to countries like, um, you know, um, Singapore or, or um, Jakarta or other, or other Asian cities, for instance, I mean, they're not that different to developed countries, right? Yeah. So as a result, I mean, one can imagine, I mean, there's great champion companies in there uh, winning domestically and some winning globally, actually, these days. And, um, and, and so, you know, those are the companies we you know, tend to look for um, because ultimately, you know, buying great businesses, um, global champions in some cases, when the valuations cheap, um, tend to be, you know, recipe for, for investment returns. So, so this is what we focus on. Yeah. And you've actually just provided a really good segue into, into the next part. I've often found it a little bit funny that to call somewhere like South Korea an emerging market, it, it actually is a little bit disrespectful. I would I would say somewhere like that. I've never been to Seoul, but it's it's living in the future from what I hear. So it's and and to call that, do you find at, at do you just want to try and redefine sort of how the emerging markets are actually defined, just so that it's not it's not like people people thinking that they're digging holes in the ground. It's actually a proper city, just that the market is is defined differently. Yeah, so I think I think um, the definition of e- EM is really you know uh, di- dictated by the benchmarks. Yeah, um, that that's driven that, but in reality. Um, a lot of the EM countries are actually very developed. I mean, you know, going to Seoul, as, as you said, or, or, or um, you know, uh, uh, Singapore. And we went, you know, recently went, actually last week, went north of uh, Singapore to this place called Johor. Um, you know, it's developing rapidly. I mean, you know, it's part of Malaysia. Mm-hmm. And you, they had, you know, 400,000 people traveling back and forth between Singapore and Malaysia through the you know, day, actually. Is that so? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Between yeah. two places. So, so I guess this is just a microcosm of the dynamism of, of what's going on in these countries. Um, that interestingly, right, from an equities perspective, um, people tend to overlook. Yeah. People focus on, I guess, as we talked about before, the AI theme, which is absolutely interesting and, and important. Uh, but there's actually lots of things happening under the surface which people are not paying attention to. So, um, what I see, you know, going to these different countries and cities is that um, there's still a lot of catch up in terms of income growth, in terms of technology adoption, in terms of the right infra- infrastructure going going into these places yeah. uh, across the board. Um, they're all growing in mid to single digits in most cases, um, and um, and and within that, there's opportunities. Yeah, I, and, and let's just go into that a little bit further. I saw this. So you mentioned some place that you can see is coming up out of out of somewhere that people wouldn't have heard of. Yeah. Do you see that? It, a. How do you find those places? How do you find those markets? What should what 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 can advisors be doing to to, to be looking out for those things? And also, do you see anywhere else that's like that right now? Because I find that fascinating that all of a sudden someone is. Yeah. Look, I mean, it's fascinating. Um, it's in some cases it's a little bit contrarian. Um, yeah. I, I got to say. Um, look, I mean, it is the. Um, you know, as we know, you know, the the the, globe, the world has become, I guess, a little bit uncertain given the the well politics in different countries and and, and the geopolitics. Um, some countries benefit from 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 the you know diversification of supply chain. You know, countries like Indonesia, India, Vietnam, and and Mexico. You know, they actually benefit from the incremental move of some of the manufacturing capacity on on the margin. You know, away from China. So so that's one. And these these countries are. I mean, absolutely booming. I mean, as a result of that, um, the, the other is actually, um, you know, China itself. I mean, clearly, um, there's been a lot of, you know, re- maybe good reasons to, to be negative on on on, on that economy. Uh, but whenever we we visit that country, uh, we're seeing a lot of innovation and a lot of, um, you know, companies actually, uh, you know, growing very nicely and the technology is improving. 
every day. Uh, and I guess in Australia, we can see you know the rise of you know companies like BYD and and, and the MGs of the world, which is actually made in Shanghai. Um, it's um, it's amazing. I mean, even just five years ago, if someone asked me, you know, can they actually make a good car? I mean, it's actually a lot of doubts, even in my mind, whether that could be done. Yep. But but within the short five years, um, you know, this is you know the you know, the you know, absolutely, I guess, um, you know, dominating certain segments of the car industry. Um, and and the thing is, I mean, that that's only one segment which they're do, doing well in amongst many others. Yep. Um, you know, knowing that that place so. So within 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 the market, which is extremely cheap for for good reasons, maybe um, there are strong companies which which are coming through, which are paying, which we are paying a lot of attention to. Um, so really, it's you know countries which are benefiting from the you know diversification of supply chain. Uh, you know countries like China, which is you know um, not the whole country, but certainly some companies within that. Um, and and I mean some of them are becoming, I, I think, becoming global champions uh, within that uh, that sort of. Um, universe of, of stocks available. Maybe that add to that in terms of some of the stuff around the the, the listing in emerging markets and just because you're listed in emerging markets by the definition of the indice providers doesn't mean that that's where the where your business is. And I think things like Samsung are, are, and are an example of that and some of the car companies in China where a lot of their revenue is coming. And to, to us, cash flows is what's important. A lot of that is coming from many different places that aren't necessarily the country where they're listed. They just happen to be listed there. Mm -hmm. But it's a lot of it's diversification in terms of where that revenue is coming from. And they're like global champions, uh, Joe, Joe said it. But that's that's very true in that they're global. A lot of these um, companies are global champions, are very much like things listed in the US, but they sometimes come with a negative connotation because they're listed in emerging markets. That's it. It's, it's it's quite funny, and that's that's great for an investor who, if there's that sort of unnecessary negative connotation, and by our nature we're we're contrarian and looking for valuation opportunities, like that's where we like to hunt in the things which are unloved and expectations are low, which means look if a company or an asset or whatever has a low expectation, it doesn't. It doesn't need to shoot the lights out to do well. It yep. just needs to do less bad than the, what the market's expecting. Yep. Which and I think that's a, yeah, and sort of to the to the nature of there's a difference between what is a good business and a good investment. So there there's heaps of great businesses out there. Don't get me wrong, but it's the valuation that is important between what's a good business and a good investment. They're not the same thing. Yep. Yeah. I mean, absolutely, uh, Bryce. I agree with that. Um, you know, for example. When we look at the memory chip companies, I mean, there's three three main pro really. The, the, you know, it's dominated by by three companies in the world making memories for for computers and for the AI chips and stuff like that. You know, the American listed one is Micron. I mean, that trades at a significant premium to the South Korean ones like SK Hynix and and Samsung. So you know, we have you know we we actually can you know own some of these things on low single digit PEs compared to the likes of Micron. So I guess it illustrates the, the valuation, um, I guess, difference uh, and the opportunities available, therefore, in, in some of these, um, you know, EM markets. Yeah. And, uh, do you find that there's a difficulty with, I mean, it's all about the flow of funds too, which is that you can have the greatest ideas sitting in, sitting in a great market, but unless you actually start to see the momentum shifting behind it, you can, and trust me, we've all been a part of that, that, that you can't, Sort of, it doesn't really get off the ground, and it doesn't really take it. Do you find that t trying to time it, or are you happy to? Is your process involved sort of more of just a buy and hold? We'll be wrong for it. We'll be wrong for a long time, but we know that it's still a a good company. It's a difficult question, isn't it? It's like we've all we've all been there. We've all run it. So to say, the way I describe how we think about it is probably like a, a farming analogy. Yeah, like I think you are planting seeds when you're harvesting other things. Nice and. You're planting seeds in something that might continue to be under pressure. But if you've got a portfolio of ideas at different stage in their vintage and you're harvesting the returns from something over here and then you can push it into things you're planting, that sort of is a I, – I like the thought of having different things at different stage in their sort of life cycle that you need a portfolio. Like if you just try and jam all these valuation opportunities into – your portfolio without thinking about that sort of thing, you, you'll you have a really rough ride. Mm. But I think that comfort of being able to harvest and push elsewhere in things that are under pressure creates – it's com like it, it's a comfort thing that you can do that knowing that 
you can accept that being under pressure because you've got something else doing working over here and that helps and then that in two or three years time that thing that was under pressure is hopefully on the other side and you're harvesting that and pushing into something else so I think that's that's how I like to think about how we manage our portfolios and how we recycle ideas and the vintage concept and that sort of thing. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. How- I, I think that's a great analogy. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to um, steal that, I think. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> harvesting and, and having, you know, basically a, a reasonably diversified exposure to different geographies and also different sectors enables ones to harvest at different times. Um, and, um, and and so I think that's the way to do it. Yeah. Well, let's talk about three because, I mean, the, the, this is a podcast that sort of it's meant to it's it's meant to be sort of ageless for a certain amount of time, which is great. Just stepping outside of this, so there's three things that are right on now that that aren't going to be immediately dated. Let's just see if we can go through them right now. The first one is China, yeah. the second one is India, and the third one to be potentially and this and the ramifications and fall through of a Trump uh, a Trump presidency. So be it be it that it has happened or it will be going to be um, <laughs> future future past present tense as I as I tend to use. It's going to happen. We're, we're, I've got it 100% factored in <laughs> at this particular time in, in our life. So let's start with China, and then and then we can go through there. So um, Joe, China. Where do you do, do you see it as being investable? Uninvestable? How do you pick it apart? Which which bits and pieces can you go into? Yeah, I think mean, with respect to China, one has to be selective at this point. Yep. Um, I think the reality is, um, you know, we we like certain businesses within that economy. And then this, and the equities are very attractively valued. So in a way, you know, it is actually a good time to 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 own those those companies. Uh, you know, which we believe will be much greater businesses in the next three to five years time when the, when when the valuations are on their knees, right? Um, and so just just stepping back a little bit, uh, we believe you know what's happened in China was just a big property market adjustment. Um, you know, the the easy you know, cookie-cutting way of growth, of building more and more apartments and infrastructures and airports and, and the like, uh, that's uh, well and truly over. Um, and, um, and and significant adjustments has already happened. Um, it's impossible to know, you know, how long the adjustment will last for for the economy. And so, therefore, we don't think buy, buying the overall market is actually the way to go. Mm. But actually, it's often in times like these that opportunities arises um, the, to, 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 you know, for the investor to pick up the really great long-term winners. I mean, remember the time of, um, you know, the, the global financial crisis in 2008 or so, um, it was a very difficult time. I mean, when, when, the, when the banking system basically blew up, right, in, in many countries. But it was exactly the right time to, to own some of the, well, even the American companies, right? I mean, when, when the system blew up, um, you know, again, you know, be selective and, and, and choose the real champions of the future. Yep. And so this is where, where we are in, in China. Uh, we're very selective. Uh, we, we think that, um, again, you know, the adjustment, is, you know, a lot of adjustment in the property side has already happened, which is a little bit um, encouraging in a way that, you know, despite the, such a big adjustment, you know, the world hasn't fallen into a Great Depression <laughs> or China itself hasn't actually fallen into a Great Depression. Yeah, that's, that's, so, yeah. So that's, that's quite nice. But I think um, yeah, the, the adjustment continues. Um, but, uh, but great companies will actually grow bigger. You know, okay. in, in coming years, and you're happy to go directly into China or, or finding it via other alternatives? Yeah, look, I mean, we we are because I mean, the great companies are listed either in in, in the Chinese Shanghai market or, or Hong Kong market or, or in the US in three in the form of um, ADRs. Mm. Uh, we we are happy to um, and have no problem whatsoever. You know, um, investing and actually, you know, uh, repatriating capital um, all, over the years, and 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 it is in fact um, we we don't think it's going to be a problem because I mean it is. Um, extremely high cost thing if if uh, if that becomes a problem, but um, so you know, but, but we don't. So, so we we're happy to do that. Yeah, and the sovereignty. What's your sovereignty risk on China at, at the moment? I remember a while ago. I mean, when everything was yeah. very cagey was w- yeah. with Hong Kong and everything yeah, like yeah. that, I yeah. did sort of have a certain amount of sovereignty risk that some of the companies that you own probably yeah just wouldn't be on the market or or, or be available anymore for a while. I did have to see that as a risk. Yeah. How much of that is still factoring in? Yeah, um, was I wrong completely? Yeah, look, I mean, it is, um, you know, the, the thing is, if we look at, um, uh, you know, the, the sovereign bond yield in China is actually quite low. So, it's you know, it's about 2.3% 2, 2. or so, or, you know, it's actually quite low. Mm-hmm. Um, um, so, um, at least, you know, the market is not factoring much much, much of that risk, um, you know, at the moment. Okay. And with us, the other, there's always uncertainty, I think, that, and there's a lot of um I don't think you'd have to go far to pick up the, the paper and see a negative headline about China or macro concerns or consumer confidence or on the in the 
the political landscape and the machinations between the US and China and like a lot of that's unpredictable. Like as much as it's important, it's the timing and the outcome of it happening is as much as we think that we can see it in the future, we can't. And there's a lot of things that are unknowable but important. And what do you do with that? I think what you do with that is, and the way we deal with that in how we invest in whether it's China or whether it's any other market, is know that you're going, there's going to be things which you cannot get comfortable with or like you just don't know. So, you, what, what, you've got a margin of safety. It's a pretty yeah. <laughs> common is like just buy it cheaper and you, you valuation, buying thing ch- buying things cheap protects you from a bit of that uncertainty that you just don't you just don't know. And as much as the yeah, old heads would say this and that, like there's just you can't you can't know some of this stuff. And valuation, buying things cheap protects you from some of that. Truth be told, I don't want to say that I coined this phrase. It's it that if I had a dollar for every time that I looked at China and said, Well that looks cheap, I'd probably be able to make up for as much as I've lost on some of these Chinese things <laughs> that I've invested in. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, the, the Hong Kong market has been one of the worst markets in the world in the last three years. I mean, it had, it had a double-digit decline for the last three years, which is almost unprecedented. I mean, I wouldn't, I don't have, I'm not a statistician, but I think, uh, you know, from memory, it is actually one of the most, you know, rare, rarest things. I mean, double-digit decline. So, you know, so the, so the outcome of that is actually what sort of Bryce mentioned which is the valuations. Um, you know, we have um, great companies, great economic mode franchises growing at 20%, 30% earnings growth in coming years and it's on, you know, double-digit PE, mm-hmm. you, know, te- you know, teens PEs. So I guess that's what we're talking about. I mean, is it, you know, is it factored in? I guess in, in most people's minds, it probably has. Um, and although it, it hasn't made the journey down for those who own the stock, you know, yeah. t- two years ago easier. Yeah. Um, and and the, the reality is also they actually, you know, a lot of them actually, um, you know, buying back shares. So that there is a bit of mathematical reason um, why, you know, why, why the share price should at least be more stable if not doing better in yeah. the coming years. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the potential for it to slingshot with, with these things is right. You just need that the turnaround in the yeah, there's something about the mentality. There's something yeah. about 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 the knowledge and the awareness. There's something about just that relative value. I mean, if you've got if you've got if you do have funds to deploy, and yeah. you look at the magnificent seven and the flow and and the US growth story in that developed market, and, you know, yeah. that's that's fairly easy situation to start talking about with the with the earnings growth they have, or you've got emerging markets that you just see like it's a difficult sort of thing to turn around. Yeah, and, and maybe I think the way we think about. And it's like investing is a probabilistic game. Like it's you've got to have a pretty disciplined process that you just crank the handle on, knowing that you're going to get something some wrong, frankly. And but over time, if you're following the same process, you will. And there's lots of ways to make money. And in it's just about being disciplined and repeating the process. And the way we think of valuation and to is the magnificent seven versus some some things in emerging markets. We like investors care about permanent loss of capital like in the industry we can talk about volatility and this and all these statistics but mums and dads care about money in their pocket yep. and permanently losing that yep. um so we think valuation and that drawdown risk is linked and when you compare something like and i'm not gonna like Nv- nvidia versus something in emerging markets like that the video is priced for perfection like a lot of things have to go right and they may well go right but a lot of things have have to go right for that to continue to just like rocket. Yeah. Whereas over on the other side, in emerging markets, as there might be a stock which is is similar, has similar, but like is probably priced much cheaper, and not as many things have to go right for that 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 to be a good investment. And yeah. I think that's that's the way we continually look at things: is discipline, process, go where the value is, do the do the deep work. Keep cranking the handle, keep repeating, and over time you'll generate good outcomes. Well, I, that I've got zero argument with that one. Now let's let's keep the go, let's keep the flavour going on this one, and switch over to the new China, as I've been calling it, the alternative China of India, um, which is where yeah, uh, which is which is I've done well in India. I've been I've been a bull for that one for the last few years. Um, I've seen it as being more if you've got a lot of. If you've got your investments and you have your manufacturing facilities, your products, your and your builders and everything that's going on in China, you've realized that you've needed to diversify away from it. You need a nice, friendly, cheap country, biggest democracy in the world, love their cricket, 
you know, all of the all of the nice things that, that, that that's there. I mean, <laughs> Prime Minister Modi got to speak in front of Congress at twice. There's 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 a handful of world leaders that have managed to do that, and that's coming from when he was he was refused entry to the to, to the US a few years ago. Don't forget that, right? How quickly these things change. Next thing you know, they've got Boeing over there. They're they're, they're also of note. They're the biggest. Yeah. Uh, arms importers in the world too, which is always important to uh, to America when it comes to their diversification as well. Cynical, Joe. India. I think I think you and I you and I are going to have a conversation about India. I know that you're itching for it. So go on. I mean, it's great. I mean, look. I mean, it's uh, we've been following India for you know close to two decades. Um, it's you know it just keeps growing. Um, the good, the important thing is that they've done a lot of reforms. Um, you know, Mr. Mr. Modi, um, as you mentioned. Um, you know, quite polarizing characters for for some. Um, you, you know, have done a lot of reforms in the banking system, in the way how the man, how the countries run, uh, in in the ease of doing business. Um, and so, um, you know, last ten years has been difficult, but but actually, recent few years, um, they're reaping the benefit of economic reforms uh, that they did. You know, um, in, in the years gone by, mm. um, and also, you know, the, the geopolitics sort of plays um, to to their to their favor because you know, as as we know. Uh, a, a bit of uh, diversification from the U.S., um, but um, so so it's all great. The story is good. Um, the, the 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 base is low. Uh, the income or GDP per capita in India is still only around two thousand U.S. dollars, mm. which is literally you know, which is literally one sixth that of, for example, China or or, or you know, uh, it's very low level. So for them to develop or grow economically is not difficult. So in in that country, we're very happy to own the really good quality franchises with long term growth, um, and 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 in doing so, we're not taking much business risk. And in fact, you know, this is what we do. We just don't want to take a lot of business risks in this, in in most and in, in all the emerging countries. So buy the great companies. The only thing I would say about India, which holds us back a little bit, is the valuation. I mean, it's a great story, um, but. Um, uh, you know, and then I guess most people agree with that, right? So, um, so that becomes a little bit problem. But even within that, we can find some 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 sectors within that country which we, you know, obviously are very happy to to participate in. I've argued that valuations in India don't matter. I've I've often had I've often had people say to me, "Look, James, it's value, it's 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 on it." And I said, "I don't, don't want to hear. I don't want to hear a forward a forward multiple. It doesn't matter." With the the systematic investment plans that are in place in India, it's one of the rare times. In investing, when in my in my view, rare times in investing when the economic growth meets the market growth, and and it's been proven. You could talk to the Alan Gray guys that that they love talking about this all the time. That that the economy and the market are are, are not the same thing, and that that there is no correlation between the two. And and I've I've heard it done. That the, the, people will bang the table about this, whether or not it's true is, is is a different matter, but apparently it is. So. But in this case, India, I think, I think actually is. So for as long as the valuation, I, I don't care about Indian valuations myself. Yeah, I'm, I, I mean, we. I mean, I guess you have to. Our, our, process, <laughs> our process is, yeah, is, yeah, yeah, is, is, yeah. is actually valuation is a, it is an impo- a very important part. Um, look, I mean, it's the reality is, I mean, the valuation has been going up and up in India, um, but it is. I mean, some of the consumer stocks are, I mean, are on you know seventy, eighty times PE. Um, growing at maybe five times, and in some cases, not all of them. So, so this is getting a bit stretched uh, from our perspective. But you know, I agree in a way that well, um, am I going to bet that the the, the the valuations comes down tomorrow? Uh, significantly, it's hard to know. It's hard to know. So, yeah, wouldn't. Uh, but it's just the risk um, we we're looking at. And well, actually, um, we can find opportunities uh, potentially better elsewhere uh, given the valuations. And that's the way like, I'd say we think think about it, is like I think. In a high growth um, company that's growing at a huge clip, I think the value it sound, might sound <laughs> strange, but valuation is probably less important as long as it sits in a band, mm-hmm. then and it keeps delivering, then yeah. it continues to justify its, its its valuation. But it's probably that risk element that if it doesn't, like these things just won't fall like five ten percent, they'll just crater. Yeah, and um. That's and it's it comes back to process. There's people who are that's their bread and butter is like that that sort of growth style of high growth, high high PE stocks, and they just have some capital controls that when things don't go right, like when they see an earnings release, they'll go okay, one, two, three, four, tick, 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 keep going, or something will just stop them out of a stock, and that's how they control against just getting really hurt. Mm-hmm. 
but it's I think and it's it's about a portfolio, right? I think it's about you might have a a, um, a manager like Joe on one on one side doing just that valuation ba- based um, investing, and then have another manager doing something else different and might be very skewed to India, which is their high growth, high P stocks, and they probably work nicely together. Yeah, I, I I do think there's just different ways to to make money, which might be which as long as you're consist- people are consistently doing it, doesn't mean your way or my way is wrong. They're just different. Hmm. And in a portfolio, they actually work really well together. Yeah. No, I can, I can, I can see there's a chance for a mix. Is that no? I can no, 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 no. I, that's where I agree. Yeah. I, think, I think it is because I mean, there's different, um, you know, different, uh, uh, you know, dif- different ways to make money. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to go now. The elephant in the room is going on, and without without putting too much of a of a specific time clock on this one, a Republican sweep, a Trump a, a Trump presidency. He, he's he's been fair, fairly obvious about sort of what his stance is going to be towards some of the markets that, that are in this space. Just general sort of crystal ballery over the next few years of what it, of what it would mean a four you know a four year term of, of of a presidency difficult it's grave you yeah. anyone, anyone, anyone so I can see you're both pointing at each other that's all right <laughs> I, I, someone's got to own yeah, this one otherwise I, I'm going to I'm just going to keep talking frankly there's <laughs> probably and you can see it in Marx there's a level of uncertainty around what a Trump presidency means for everything and you could. Make that case for like Taiwan's an obvious example yep. around um, some of the semiconductor businesses like TSMC and so you're, I think the the market moves ahead of any 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 him actually being in in office when he's in office and I think you've you've got a a bit of a a blueprint from he's very much reactive and just does his thing yes he's he's pretty calculated clearly but there's and there's some policies he will clearly bring in, and how that works through. I'd say there's, it's already a bit priced. Some of that stuff's priced in, but look, it's hard to see it be being more certain than it is currently. Like I think there's just uncertainty, mm-hmm. and and markets don't like uncertainty. Yeah, but uncertainty creates opportunities. Frankly, um, when it becomes just like everything has a price. Yeah. Joe, is, yeah. is 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 there an amount of sleep that you're sort of sacrificing in for the next four years? Is it going to be? I, look, I mean, it's um, it, in in a way. I mean, this is his second rendition. If he gets in, I mean, it's not a certainty, but look, look, I mean, it is. It does look like he has a a very good chance yeah. <laughs> at the moment. Um, I think from where we sit, I mean, he it appears that I mean, the the, the goal is to. I mean, his goal appears to be one of the goals is to reindustrialize the United States. I mean, is to bring industries back, um, you know, move away from perhaps the you know EVs of the world to to more traditional um, oil and gas, uh, 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 you know, um, supply chain. Um, so it, it it will be, I think, you know, uh, disruptive. And then really, the tariffs is I, I, you know, from what I read is not just on China. I mean, it's actually. Put, putting up tariff to encourage um, people to build plants back in in, in the US, um, but it's interesting. I mean, it's interesting to, to see exactly what he's going to do because it, in multiple occasions, you know, he's actually talked about you know asking um, you know Chinese EV companies to build plants in places like Detroit and Michigan, um, and this is on the weekend. Um, whereas um, the current administration actually you know talk about you know big tariffs on Chinese EV. So. So it's uh, the aim is is different, um, and I think it probably does mean uh, what we're used to um, in in you know in, in how the, the world uh, this globalizing world that we're used to um, may actually um, well at least it would push the other way. I mean you know him moving away from the trade agreements uh, and and um, you know putting up tariffs, um, encourage people to build plants in, inside the country, and maybe includes you know even more encouragement or who knows. Uh, Forceful encouragement of TSMC to build bigger plants in, in the US, perhaps you know stuff like that. Yep. So I think it is likely to be to be a big change, and and the implication of that to to inflation oh. um, and um, economic growth globally uh, is interesting. And then of course I also think about what's the implication of that to asset prices. I mean things which which are which are you know priced to perfection. Uh, you know, big, big, you know, the, the high growth industries, high high P. You know, so 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 it is something that we we keep watching and watching very carefully. Um, the other thing is, that if we step back um, from just the Trump question um, to to just the you know the the, the move from perhaps 
a unipolar world to a, to a multipolar world, uh, what does it mean to from an investment perspective? Um, does it mean that um, you know basically stronger economies or stronger countries actually dictate what goes on actually you know in the world in in bigger ways than than today? Maybe I'll just build on one of the comments you made, and like I think there's some of the none of this action has. <laughs> It all has consequences in yeah. terms of so reshoring is one one example. And if you think through what that means and frankly why a lot of developed markets manufacture a lot of things offshore is co- like cost. Mm-hmm. And then if you move that back to those back to the US, but that's not, not just a there's no there's consequence of that around what that means for input costs, what how that flows through the chain in terms of profitability what that means for profitability of US companies and the flow on effect. Like it's it's every action has a reaction. Um and I think that that's just one example. I'm not saying that that's yeah, like mm-hmm. but you know like if you that concept of you do something, it's gonna have a consequence and that's an obvious consequence of reshoring to the US is a cost inflation. Mm. Yeah. So I mean I, I think I think exactly and, and I suspect um, that and this kind of stuff is what the market's trying to price in, right? I mean, in the next six months, you know, what's going to happen? What's going to, what's inflation going to look like a few years down the track and, and growth and, and the like? And if we go back to the earlier discussion, the margin of safety, really, I think the, the, the one thing that helps us is, uh, valuation. I mean, if the valuation is already quite cheap and if your earnings actually going to likely to be resilient, um, even in the face of, some big, um, you know, p- political or geopolitical changes. Then, then, um, then, then at least, um, you know, it, it, it's uh, it's uh, it's it's lower risk. You know. Um, yep. it- uh, okay. Well, uh, speaking of that, so Sigwe, just coming back to the questions because I think we're sort of went off track a little bit there. But the, <laughs> so I've got no problem with that because because it, it is important. It is something that's going to be that, that's on the on the tip of everyone's lips, um, and it's going to be for the next at least four years of doing this. Season. Yeah. I'm glad that I'm out of active management. Truth be told, I'm glad that I'm out of active management because I hated waking up or being up overnight or waking up after a decent night's sleep. Yeah, seeing some some tweet, a tweet. Yeah, it was just going to set the entire <laughs> just set the entire agenda for the next for the next 48 hours. It was just like okay, I had things planned and now that's all off the table. Or I had things invested that now I need to rearrange everything that I'm doing. Yeah. I can't live like that anymore. I've, the, look at my hair. But well, you can't. But anyway, so the, um, uh, now let's talk about inflation. Let's talk about inflation. Where the rates are at, the, at, at generally, sort of speaking, over the over, over the year and and the years ahead, um, how are emerging markets? So, if, where do you see the rate cycle moving? How does the rate cycle change? This is an advisor question that's come in. How does where the rates are shifting? I mean, China's doing some things with their rates around around now, and the inflationary outlook. How do you see that affecting certain markets in in your spaces? Yeah, I think it's very. There's not one answer. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I think that. Is there is there anything that's a standout? Because I think, I think generally when you think of what, and I'm going to use the, the US as an example, you think of what high rates and inflation and a strong US dollar does for emerging markets. Mm. So as a general rule, that is going to make any US denominated debt more expensive for emerging markets or for that emerging market, which is a bad thing mm. for them, which they don't have much control over, which di- indifferent to local currency debt. And then there's the capital flow element that flow will come out of that emerging market and push back to the higher returning um, US market. But if you look at emerging markets as a whole now and the different pieces there, a lot of them are at different different stages. There's markets that are cutting rates There's market and inflation is coming down. There's other markets where it's going the other way. So, it's a, it's a big melting pot um, of different countries at different spots for for different reasons. Um, and so I think it's that general thing of a strong US dollar is bad for emerging markets is, is true and, all, and all holds generally. But if you think of what's happening in emerging markets, everything's at different stages. Um, and I think the market expectations reflect that and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, I agree. So, so, so the USD has been the strong US dollar has been a uh, Headwind, right? I mean, for emerging markets, um, equities, um, and you know the, the 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 reduction of interest rates in the U.S. I think is you know definitely definitely positive for for this asset class. 
Um, and why is that? Well, you know, cost of debt, and also, well, you know, the, um, a lot of e emerging countries. Um, I think most of them, maybe not all of them, um, do not have an inflation problem, and but they've kept the interest rate reasonably high because of, um, you know, generally speaking, because they want to hold, you know, to to maintain uh, currency strength, right, relative to the strong dollar. Mm -hmm. So if the U.S. dollar can weaken or, or interest rate falls, then it really enables them to cut quickly. And um, given the valuation where they are for most markets, uh, you know, it, it can be quite good for 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 equities. So I think that's uh, that's where we are at the moment. Okay. And well, and the, maybe to add to and because like, currency is a pretty important thing for if you're investing. In I'm surprised it's not actually one of the questions um, here. There you go. Here's a question for you. how important is currency to emerging <laughs> markets? Price, <laughs> like, price for Morningstar over the years. All right. When you, because I think when you invest generally in um, emerging markets, unlike developed markets, it's prohibitively expensive to remove the currency. And I don't know that in many cases. So when you invest in a market, you've got to be happy to take the the, the currency yeah. that you um, get, whether that's in fixed income or um, or equities. And like when we look at the currency picture, I think because there's such a strong US dollar or has been, all the emerging market currencies as a generalization are pretty attractive so that it's a good – when you think of, yes, the equity markets are, are reasonably attractive and you take into account, okay, the, the currency is attractive. Well, it's a, like a nice like double, double mm -hmm. like you, that, you, that you get both and you sort of have to get both in many, most cases. But it's a, a nice thing that you, um, because of such a strong US dollar, you have, I would say, on a valuation perspective, a reasonably attractive emerging market set of currencies. Yeah, you're saying that, that currency currency impact on emerging markets. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a bit of a tax when a currency goes down for you, right? Yeah. I mean, in these assets and and a weaker USD, I mean, clearly, um, you know, enable this currency to be stronger relatively. Yeah. yeah, I've I've always found that there's a, and I'm about to go into specific uh, specific products and methods of from not, not specific products, but specific ways in which you, you can uh, invest in emerging markets. There's one trick that I've got, which is that if you know. This is sort of a funny one. As an Australian, it's very easy to do so. That if you if you're absolutely 100 percent confident, not that you ever can be, but if you're if you're reasonably confident that the US dollar is going to rally, which theoretically on paper should bring down emerging markets somewhat, uh, you would invest in an inversely correlated emerging markets <laughs> ETF. Um, specifically, there's a, there's a, 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 a negative one for one sort of situation. <laughs> the, the the code is actually EUM. So that you and you'd unhedge that you wouldn't be hedged, right? So you'd be investing in US dollars in something that goes up if emerging markets come down. You're effectively doubling doubling up on that one. That when it, when it does come up, you you do it and you sort of rub your hands together and it's going to be fantastic. <laughs> if it goes if it goes if it goes wrong if it goes wrong though, that's the situation on the downside. Okay. What are some uh, what are some products and areas that, that that come to mind that might be a good way to invest in emerging markets right now? Uh, in, anyway, in, in asset classes, not products, asset classes. I'm meaning sort of. Yeah, well, I think we've been pretty equity heavy yeah, around um, what we've discussed, but there's different ways in which you can um, invest in emerging markets. And I think the whether that's in equities, fixed income, and fixed income in in emerging markets broad. So you've got mm. hard currency, which is which is EM countries issuing US dollar debt, which sort of acts more like high yield um, in in terms of its behaviour, and then local currency debt, which is an emerging market issuing in their own currency, which means they have a lot more control over how that, like they can control the debt through their, their tax and all that sort of stuff. So it's a bit, there's a, so they're quite different, those parts, but there's equities, fixed income, and then there's other more, I guess, quirky stuff. Yeah. Uh, and I think as you go more into that, you probably need a lot more expertise and on the ground knowledge and, because with emerging markets, and if you're talking private equity or something, you might there's a lot more around, I guess, legal structures and legal stuff around yeah. how you'd make money there. Equities, equities and bonds is pretty much as far as I'd, I'd actually be able to guide someone myself, and I've been doing this for a while. Mm -hmm. the, uh, you mentioned the bonds. Uh, did, do you have any bond allocation? No, no, it's all equities. equities. But yeah. it, I think the difference is just, I, I guess, um, you know, the equity exposure is, I mean, probably the high octane. Um, sort of exposure, you know, you, you have the whole. That's enough. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, the, the sector goes well, then well, I mean, they go up many times. Yeah. You know, you know, fifty, hundred percent. I mean, some, something like that. So that's, you know, give you the upside in share, the share price, and also the the currencies if you're on the right side of the, of the investment or trade. So, um, all right, yeah. Well, we do have lots more. We could go through a lot more, but I think that we've, we're maxed out our time. I think that the tape is coming to an end. Uh, anything else to finish off? Otherwise, I'll close it off here. 
No, very good. Thank you for joining us on this uh, Ensemble Investment Podcast brought to you by Morningstar. I have been joined by Joseph Lai, Principal and Portfolio Management uh, Manager of Ox Capital, and Bryce Anderson of Morningstar, who's a Portfolio Manager there. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thanks very much, James. My name is James Whelan, uh, Managing Director of Buckley Pierce Capital's Wealth Management Team, and thank you for joining us. Have yourself a great day, week, and year.